Welcome to Learning in the Making. I'm your host, Aran, and here on Learning in the Making, we invite you every episode to join us in project-based learning and project-based lessons where we invite you to use the materials found in your own environment to play, explore, discover, understand, and ultimately make the world around you. Uh, here on Learning in the Making, we are on episode 17. Um, in our previous episodes, we've invited you to join in designing shoes, in making stuffed creatures, in creating self-care boxes, and today we are joined by a powerhouse educator, Annalise Klein. Hi, Annalise. Hi, I'm so excited to be here and make some art with you today. Mm, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, Annalise is a chemist and a creative writer, a scientist and an artist, and she is an educator as well as a learner. Annalise is passionate about expanding our understanding of what a scientist is and what science is. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I um, love getting to work with different communities and hear different stories. And I'm all about thinking, how can we reframe our idea of who a scientist is? And a lot of like, what did our ancestors or our own heritage bring um, to scientific thinking and um, using the natural world? Uh, so, Annalise, I know that you love both chemistry and art. So what is the project that you are going to lead us through today? Yeah, today we are going to be making some paints by extracting some pigments and dyes from everyday materials that you already have in your kitchen. Wow. Okay. Um, what are the materials that we're going to need for today's project? Yeah, so it depends on what you have around you. Um, some things that you definitely need are some bowls, um, some really hot water, and some materials that give you some nice, strong pigments or dyes. Um, some things that I have found that work really well are spinach. Um, also, carrots could work really well if you've got some old ones lying around in your fridge. Um, Let's see, what else? Instant coffee, if you have that. Um, berries, if frozen or fresh. Um, and also tea bags, either black tea or herbal tea. Those are really, really good. Um, you can experiment with other things as well that you think might have good colors. Um, and then also, if you have um, access to red cabbage and you can get a small pot and access to a stove, we can make some really cool pigment from red cabbage as well. Um, if we're then using those paints to actually do something, create um, art, we're also going to need some paint brushes or you could use q-tips and paper. So watercolor paper would work really well, um, but I'm just going to use printer paper. So if you just have regular white paper lying around, you can definitely try that. And that's all you need. Okay. All right. Well, I have um, some assorted fruits and veggies here. I have some spinach. I have some red cabbage. I have some lemons. I also awesome. have a tea bag here. I also have this bowl of frozen berries that is no longer frozen and melting so you can already right, melt see yeah it's color. there's there's some natural paint right there we're definitely gonna use that that's awesome um different pigments and dyes are extracted in different ways so even though we have you know a wide variety of things kind of just like people we don't treat them all the same they have different personalities they have different circumstances and so um you know, red cabbage, we're going to need to boil for a long time in hot water in order to extract that pigment and dye. Um, I like to think of red cabbage as being this really stubborn vegetable. He's really going to need to sit in that hot water for a long time before he's willing to release um, his really beautiful purple color. So um, others are not quite as stubborn, so we don't need to boil them and put them on the stove. Okay. 
Um, I did also want to bring up um, and share my screen for a minute because this is not a new thing. Different communities and different cultures have used natural dyes um, to, to make things um, both decorative and just like everyday objects. So uh, the Navajo Nation has woven um, blankets for a really long time. Here's some examples you can just see some of the natural um, things that they've used to make the different colors of their fibers. Um, here's another example, and, and I notice when I look at this, hey, some of them are using um, flowers and petals, others are using leaves, others are using stems um, of plants, so you can draw that color out from lots of different places, and people have been experimenting and refining that process for a really long time. If we're looking in the Bay Area, which is where we are located, the Ohlone people um, who are indigenous to the Bay Area used a lot of different um, dyes. We don't have records of all of them, but here are two that we know of the white alder tree. Um, the roots, if we pull some of the roots, they produce a rusty red brown color. Um, another one that they use is the tan oak tree. And that one, the bark, can be boiled and then made into a dye. So these are trees that are native to this place. Um, you might actually see some of them around. And now you know there's more to it than just it being a tree and providing shade. Um, there's other uses that people have used for a really long time. Um, and then I wanted to highlight one artist. This is Linda Yamane. And as I was researching this um, for this project, I came across some videos that she made. And she um, is Olone, and she has been spending her adult life researching and learning more about her culture's traditions um, because she was not able to be taught by her parents or grandparents this craft of basket weaving. Um, she thought there were no more baskets made by the Ohlone people in existence. She thought they were all gone. And researching in her adult life found there's probably 25 to 30 baskets that are still around today. Um, they're not all in California. People have collected them or taken them and traded them. Um, but the Oakland Museum of California sponsored her to become um, to make more of these baskets and to become an artist. Um, and she's doing what is called the Ohlone Basket Project. So I highlight this because she's using um, the plants and things around us in the Bay Area. And if you look in the bottom left, uh, bottom right corner um, over here, you see some of that red. And she uses chicken feathers that she's dyed red um, to put into those baskets. So just another example of how we can use nature around us, use different types of dyes um, in, in this work. Wow, I'm Annalise, I'm really already learning so much. I've known a little bit about like how we can use different plants and things, um, but the tree bark, that feels like a really new learning for me. I had no idea that we could use tree bark or roots um, to, to get those colorings. Um, yeah, right, different, we see it on flowers, right? We notice the color. We wouldn't necessarily think, um, yeah, that bark, it just looks brown, right? And it looks dry or roots are often under the ground so we can't see them. But um, it definitely, there are things that are available and, and it's not a new practice, um, but sometimes it's new to us because that knowledge hasn't been passed down or elevated. Um, one thing that was kind of interesting that Linda was talking about in one of her videos is that when she goes to the park, she wants to gather and use some of the materials, you know, from this place. But people who made the rules in the park say, you know, don't touch things, don't pick it, right? We want to respect, you know, the, the health of the plants. And if everyone went out and picked things, that would probably not be great. But um, there, I think if we know more about um, different ways of using nature than just like it exists and we should protect it in a in a bubble by itself um, that there's a relationship between humans and plants um, that could even affect the ways we interact with parks and natural spaces around us hmm. thank you for sharing that i really appreciate the distinction around 
or the clarification that like these are not new practices and they may be new learnings to us I really appreciate I really appreciate that and also just thinking about how um, we can be engaging with our natural world with our environment um, in a way that is relational and in a way that allows us to um, create beautiful art. I'm, I'm excited for that part. So yeah, um, cool. how, how do we make ours? What do we have to do? Okay, let's get started. So let's start with the stuff that's easiest to extract first. Okay. Um, get some hot water, get it near boiling. Um, you can do this a couple different ways. You can put it on the stove. If you have, ooh, nice, an electric kettle like that, then it, you just got to press that button. Um, or if you have a microwave, you can microwave the water. Um, just make sure you have adult supervision if ha- handling hot water is not something you do a lot. Um, then you're going to take your first material. Um, let's, let's start with spinach. Um, and we're going to break it down a little bit. Okay, so just take it and rip it into pieces. Okay, and you're going to put it in your bowl and add maybe a quarter cup of water or even less. Okay, we just want to use the heat from that water to to break open um, some of those cells and get get that pigment extracted. Okay, do I um, break up the stem too or just the leaf? You can, so let's look at the stem. Do you think the stem has much um, color to offer? I could be wrong, but I really don't think so. I don't think so either. Most of that, the chlorophyll and the colors are going to be in the leaf. Um, So I think you can just leave the stems out. But again, right, we we just talked about like sometimes color comes from places we didn't expect, right, like roots and bark and stuff. So I'm going to say for this, the stems we don't need, but feel free to experiment if you would like. Okay. So once I have it in the cup, then I add water. We're going to add just a little bit of water. Um, you don't want too much in there because that's just going to make it more diluted um, when we want to use it as paint. And then once you have all that in the bowl, grab a spoon or something to break up that material into smaller and smaller pieces. We're going to just mash it down for about 30 seconds. Okay. While you're working hard at that, I will tell you a little bit about the science behind um, what you're doing right now. So what we're doing is breaking up the surface area, or we're increasing the surface area of those leaves. So we imagine that this piece of paper was a leaf. Um, the ripped edges on the outside, that's the cells are going to be able to release that, that chlorophyll. So the more we rip it apart in the smaller and smaller pieces, we're creating more edges, more more and more cells that are going to be on that edge um, to get broken apart. Um, and then the hot water helps just break those cells even open even more. Okay. So once it, you know, you mash it around for a while, you'll start to see that that stuff is, is separating. Um, then you can put it on the side and we can strain it if you have some sort of like strainer or you could use a fork and a spoon um we just want to kind of get some of the gunk out and leave with that colored water okay how's that going it's going good i'm seeing it. it's like a like a lime green color in there oh cool okay so i will just use my fork to spoon that out oh nice. you see it wow oh yeah nice Vibrant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really interested if other people try this, what else people are able to find and make other types of, of colors. Like I know spinach works. Uh, if you have kale or red chard or just regular lettuce, like I'm curious what all of those would do too. So if any of you are doing this and experimenting with new stuff when you tag it, I want to know what what you use to make your paints. Okay. Um, I also have, I feel like my berries have kind of created the paint on their own. Mm. Just by like the ice melting off and turning into water. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we already have some water kind of mixed in with that. 
Um, so yeah, if you have something that's kind of paint consistency, um, you can just pour it in. Um, you don't necessarily have to add water. I will say if you, um, some things might get kind of sticky. So if we need to kind of thin it out to make it more like a paint, um, you might need to add water. But what you have there with those berries looks looks good. So the water sometimes helps thin it out, make it more like paint so that when it dries, it's not, <laughs> um, you don't have like food residue on there. But that looks that looks good. Okay. So I have a green color now. I have a red color now. Nice. Um, I actually have some OT. If you can see, that's already that's got it. like a nice brownish color. Yeah. Maybe I'll pour. I'll wasting anything. Strain it. Kind Perfect. Of brownish. That's kind of an orange. orange. Yeah. I like that a lot. And then I found that teas oftentimes work the best. I had like an herbal tea that had, um, I don't even know what it had in it, but it made a really pretty pink purple color too. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have red, we have green, we have like a burnt orange color. Um, what other colors can we make? All right, well, let's do a really fun one. Let's get that red cabbage out. Um, okay. So red cabbage is what uh, we call a pH indicator. And if, what that means is if we mix it with an acid, something that has a low pH, it will change color and it'll become a red color. If we mix it with a base, something that's higher up on the pH scale, it will become a blue color. Um, so we have some acids and bases in our everyday life. Um, and so we're going to we're going to try and, and do that. But first, we got to make the cabbage juice. So go ahead and take, um, if you have your small pot, this size or something like it will do just fine. Um, and then we're going to take the red cabbage leaves and we're going to rip them up again into kind of smaller pieces. I'd say three or four cabbage leaves are fine. And then we're going to put them in the pot, add about two cups of water, so more water than the other stuff. Um, and we're gonna just set it on the stove to boil for five to 10 minutes. Okay, remember that cabbage leaf is really stubborn, so we gotta get it, get it going in hot water for a long time before it releases that color. Now, once the color of the water is a vibrant pink or purple, we're gonna take it off the stove and we're gonna let it cool down. Okay, so I actually have mine. Magic! Yep, I boiled mine a little earlier. So you can see my cabbage leaves have actually changed color yeah. compared to the raw. This is the cooked. Wow, the look raw. at that. Um, and yeah, this the purple is just beautiful in here. I can see it from here. I bet it's even more impressive in person. So yeah, once it's all cool, you can pour a little bit of it off. We could use some of that purple on its own. Now we've got a purple color. Um, but let's let's use that pH indicator characteristic um, to do some fun things. So let's start with an acid. Okay, so pour a little bit of that um, juice off into a, a smaller cup. And then do you have an acid? Acids are include like lemon juice or vinegar um, are two common household ones. Um, I do, I have lemon. All right. Oh, okay, this is very exciting. So take some of that lemon, squeeze it into your uh, red cabbage juice and see what happens. Okay, wait, I'm excited. What? <laughs> Whoa. Do you see that? Yeah. It's starting to change, yeah. Awesome, if we give it a swirl, it'll all mix together. Nice, and that, ooh, look at that. Wow. So that, P, the red cabbage is like, hello, we have <laughs> acid in the house. We are now turning red to show you there is an acid here. Pretty crazy, right? Wow, this is beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna try and show you, I do not have as cool of a, studio setup as you do, but um, so that was an acid. Let's see what happens with a base. Well, yeah, see that looks black. Got a light. 
Okay, maybe. So that looks kind of purple to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a base, a common, some common bases that you might have in your house are um, laundry detergent um, or baking soda. So baking soda is what I have. Just got a little bit on this. I'm going to dump it in. Let's see what happens to that color. Let's see if it works for me. Swirling him around. Okay. I can see the color change, but I'm not sure if you guys can. I think it still looks kind of dark. I can, I, it shifted kind of though. Color? Yeah, it, it definitely looks more blue. Okay. Now, from my perspective, like this looks like, do you ever have those like shark gummies? <laughs> I don't know. It's a very, <laughs> that's, that's like what it's reminding me of. It's actually a super cool blue, but you can't see very well. You'll just have to try it at home because it's pretty blue. Mm -hmm. um, so now I've got a red, I've got a purple, and I've got a blue that I could use. Wow. Um, are there any other what, plants or like vegetables mm -hmm. that have this pH indicator? Like yeah, that's a, cabbage? Such a good question. Um, so I know that red onion will also do the same. You could boil red onion and get um, the color out. Anything that has the molecule anthocyanin in it will react in the presence of an acid or a base. Anthocyanin. So, okay. Anthocyanin. There you go. Um, so what it does is when we have an acid or a base that comes in, it reacts with that to make a new molecule. So our eyes see this chemical reaction. The product um, is a new molecule and our eyes um, see that as a different color. So that's what we're seeing happen when we add an acid or a base to that juice. Okay, so let me get this clear. Red cabbage, red cabbage, which I mm -hmm. really love to make like, a coleslaw for tacos. Oh yeah. Um, red cabbage can give you three different colors, three different colors for your paints, like the purple mm -hmm. one, the pink one if you add an acid, and a blue one if you add a base. That's right. Wow, that's wow. awesome. That is awesome. Okay, well, I have quite a few colors here. I have Are we ready to paint? Green? Yep, I'm ready to paint. Let's do it. I think you're all set. Okay, so I have a couple over here as well. Um, yeah, we have these paints. Now, these paints, even though they look super vibrant in the cups, um, they are like very, very diluted watercolor paints. Mm. So we might have to practice some layering techniques in order to transfer the pigment or the dye onto our paper. Um, for me, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my, my paper that I'm going to use. Um, because I'm going to, I know I have to do that layering and it's going to um, be a more natural subdued color that I'm going to get. Um, I am going to choose to paint some patterns on paper instead of painting a, a big detailed picture. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to use that. I'm going to let it dry. I might use it to make some collages or maybe as cards. So the way I'm going to do this, I've been thinking about, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to do. Um, I, I'm going to take some different people in my life who I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to use them as inspiration for the patterns that I'm going to make, or maybe it's going to help me choose, you know, which paints I'm going to use. Um, do you have somebody in mind that you're thinking of um, for making your own patterns? Um, I do. I do. Uh, my grandma is someone who comes to mind. My grams, Gwen. Um, and something that I am grateful to her for is just like inviting me into this love of nature and gardening. Um, so we used to garden together when I was younger. Oh, cool. And now that I live away from home, it's something that we talk about on the phone all the time. She's always asking me. Um, how my garden is doing. So I think I'm going to use patterns or create patterns that reflect 
um, gardening or nature, maybe garden tools. I love that. What sort of things would she grow? Mm, I th- wow. Well, one thing that comes to mind that was my favorite. I don't know if she grew it so much as we tended to it, but mm. a huge avocado tree. Oh, um, my. At one, I'm from LA, so a, a huge avocado tree um, at a house she used to live in in LA. Um, and green tomatoes. She loves green tomatoes and she loves to grow them and then fry them. So that's, oh she's been gosh. encouraging me to do that because I've had a lot of tomato plants growing mm-hmm. um, that I love to care for, but I actually don't enjoy tomatoes so much. I'm not a big tomato fan either. My, this is a funny story. My parents actually told me when I was little, I wasn't really a picky eater, but I hated tomatoes. And I also was like bald until I was three. And I just wanted beautiful, long hair. Like that was just all I wanted. And so they told me if I ate tomatoes, it would make my hair grow long. So I would choke them down. So now not only do I not like the taste of tomatoes, it also just reminds me of how my, my parents, you know, capitalized on my, my insecurity and made me eat things I didn't like. Made you eat tomatoes. <laughs> but you like green tomatoes. I do. Fried. Fried green tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fried green tomatoes. I love that. Yeah. And I think um, now that she's older, she really enjoys... Um, just tending to different like potted plants um, Mm -hmm. and trees and such that are out in the yard. So I'm drawing some, I'm using coffee as my paint right now. I really like it. It gives me a really nice, strong brown color. Um, And I'm using, as I'm, using it, the smell is reminding me of um, my aunt and my aunts and uncle um, in Kona. So my mom's side of the family is from Hawaii. And I used to teach there. And anytime our family would go and visit my um, auntie and um, my uncle, we'd always go out for dinner and then we always go back to their house afterwards um, to just talk story. And we just, you know, either stories from like our, our family or how people in the community were doing. And um, they'd always, they had the U-Ban coffee, it's like in that um, coffee tin. And it was always delicious. Like, I love their coffee. I don't know how they do it. I, there's something magical about their coffee. So I always still... Um, I remember smelling it when I was really little before I drank coffee and now, you know, I get, I get to participate as well. So that's what I'm, I'm drawing Mm. right now. So here's mine so far. I've been drawing a lot of circles, kind of like, you know, when you set your coffee mug down and you get that ring. Yeah. I started doing that. Oh, wow. That's beautiful circles we'll see if I keep filling them in or what I do this one's a work in progress what do you have wow so I am definitely noticing what you were saying about layering Mm. yeah and I have actually taken to uh using the spinach to just scribble <laughs> like I'm actually just putting this yeah yeah like it's the carrier wet spinach <laughs> Interesting. okay <laughs> making like different leaf pat leaf yeah patterns. yes getting a little That's experimental cool. um we adapt and we keep oh yeah look at that the berries are showing up really well mm-hmm. on first go Um, I also have something I was working on, um, with the berries as well. Yeah. Just like a lot of spirals representing interconnectivity, um, and kind of just like growing and evolution. 
Yeah. So I want to add some some green to this as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's what I got going. Cool. Okay, I've got two more I'll show you. Okay. What I was working on this a little earlier too. So this one I made for my friend Anna. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, you can see how muted it is, right? It's not super vibrant, but I love how it turns out. And it, it definitely, as it dries, you start to see it more and more. Um, but I'm going to send, I'm actually going to write like a little note on the back of this one for Anna. Oh, there it is. Um, so this reminds me of her because we met in organic chemistry lab. Mm. Um, and so I, that's what the green is for because I feel like green... You think of organic, um, it's with life. Organic chemistry is just anything that has to do with the element carbon. So we that's where we met. And then we would always, um, she always sends me coffee now. Um, mm. Coffee is very important <laughs> in my life. Yeah. Um, so that, there's the coffee stripe. So when I moved away, um, she sends me my favorite coffee from my favorite store um, in the mail. And then... The pink stripe is from cherry juice that I had. And she, her town that she grew up in is very famous for cherries. And mm. so that reminds me of her. Um, and then my last one that I made, I just want to show a different technique. I had some, um, there we go. <laughs> I have some washi tape. Um, and so I put that on before I painted. And now when I peel it back. Wow. I let it dry overnight and now this looks kind of cool right Wait, i haven't seen it yet so like fun this. i'm actually really happy with that so I love that. you don't even need washi tape you could any type of scotch tape or something like that um would work really well so yeah i'm actually quite pleased with that yeah it looks so, awesome a couple different ways of 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 doing this painting awesome um, well, I think that is it for us here on learning in the making for today. Um, but that by no means means that you have to stop in your creation. We encourage you to look around and explore, get creative, get experimental, continue to make your paints. Um, and continue to make creations from them, whether they're collages or cards or wrapping paper, um, pictures, whatever you can think of. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so I definitely want to see what you made. So share your project with us at makered.org or hashtag makered at home on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and definitely include what different things you're using or who you're inspired by as you're making these different patterns. Um, there's so much room for creativity on this. So I'll give it a shot. If some stuff doesn't work, just allows you to be more creative um, in different ways you can troubleshoot or try something new. Mm, yes, thank you. Um, and Elise, I just, I wanna thank you for bringing just your spark and um, your commitment to young people and all your wisdom around chemistry and sharing that with us here today. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you watching, you can find more projects um, at the Maker Ed website. Um, and yeah, keep learning and keep making.